Hey everyone, welcome back to uh, our first Q&A here on YouTube. We have done them before on Instagram, um, but we're bringing it to YouTube now, uh, hoping to get both audiences involved. So we have some questions that we got on Instagram uh, about what we do here, uh, about cameras, about film, about all kinds of stuff. So we'll go ahead and, and answer them here. If you have any questions of your own that pop up during the video, um, leave a comment below and, and we'll get to them. Or on Instagram on Thursdays. Yeah. So, first one is from Lasse Frobese. Any good alternatives to the Cla Fuji Class A W? Looking for a wide angle point and shoot. I mean, there's a lot of options out there. If you're looking for something with a wide angle lens, not a zoom, um, the Ricoh GR1 is a great option. The Ricoh R1 is a slightly cheaper option. Uh, we have one just behind me up in this corner. <laughs> This is a, a Rolle Prego Micron, which I don't know if they copied Rolle. They licensed. Or, yeah, Re, or Rico, I mean. But it it's real euros. similar. This is real. It was 10 euro at some point, but that's because it doesn't work. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, depends on how wide you want to go. On point and shoots, usually you'll find quite a lot of options 28 mil, mm -hmm. and then you'll see less and less the wider you go. Yeah. Uh, the Fuji Natura has like a 21. That's a 24. 24, 24 1.9, which is really cool, but it's really hard and expensive. Yeah, that's a, a Minolta TC1 thing. is a 28, but that's it's also very expensive. Yep. The main question is find something that's reliable that works. Yeah, also, the, the, the Class W is probably a 28 millimeter. I, I'm yeah, not something there. sure. But it's also alternatives. The, At the end, it depends on the price point you want to go to, because yeah. depending on the price, you can go higher or lower. Yeah. Uh, but simple, cheap, wide, I guess we have the Vivitar wide. That that new one? The new one that's yeah. like Plastic Fantastic. I think wow. it's relabeled by Reto mm -hmm. as a camera. You can check that one. It's like 50 bucks. And that bucks. is super wide. And yeah. it's pretty wide. Yeah. Lomo I probably has one as well. Um, oh, LCA or LCY? Yeah, they have the LC, LC wide, and, yeah. and those are kind of fun, almost fisheye-like cameras. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, let's move on to the next one. Next question <laughs> from Martinal J North. We have, what camera do you suggest for someone who is starting photography? Go ahead, you lead the way on this one. I'll start with a, a working camera. So <laughs> one thing that a lot of people do as a mistake when starting in photography is they will go with something a friend gives them or they find in their parents' you know, cupboard or grandma's drawer, and many times that brings us to the problem of cameras have aged poorly. Mm -hmm. So a working camera is pretty good. Um, there's a quite a few tips and tricks online from our own website to other stuff to check how to make sure a camera can work. Mm -hmm. But if we're going for, and he specifies photography, if we're going film photography, I think a lot of people uh, advise manual cameras like the Pentax K1000, Yashica FX3, things like this. I would add that I'd rather start with something a little bit more automatic to get the gist of shooting film because the first time when you hear ISO aperture, shutter speed, pushing, pulling, hyperfocal, all these things, it might be confusing. So something like a Canon 300V is like a ugly duckling but very good camera and it, it works. And Minolta, I think I have a Dynax, what is it, 7? You, you have a Dynax uh, 5. 5. That camera is amazing. Mm -hmm. And it does everything for you. And then you can start choosing what you want to do yourself. Do I want to yeah. choose the ISO myself? Then mm -hmm. that's one step. Then I want to choose the aperture myself. That's a second step. And then I want to choose everything myself. And then you have the assistance of the over and under exposure. Yeah. I think going full into a manual camera and trying to understand Sunny 16 rules and stuff, it might be a bit too much. It's like getting in a car and without any lessons being like thrown down the hill and being like, yeah. now you've got to learn gears <laughs> and uh, how to use the brakes and yeah. the indicators, but we're not going to tell you what's what. And it's a lot to do all at once. Yeah. Yeah. What's your advice for starting? <laughs> well, from from dealing with customers, I think that my, my spiel when somebody comes in and, and asks for their first camera, for help buying their first camera, um, I think there are two two different uh, schools to it. One being dive headfirst into that deep end, and two being go with something more automatic and sort of work your way into uh, semi-auto modes and auto modes and then into manual if you want to. Um, and I think it really depends on what you want to be doing with photography because you can have just as much fun with an automatic point and shoot that does everything for you 
and you never learn anything about shutter speed, aperture, ISO. Composition only. Yeah. And you just, you know, if you want to take pictures of your friends and have fun, grainy film pictures, that's just as valid as somebody who wants to sit there with a Siconic light meter and measuring all the ambient Spot angles. Meters. Yeah. So. <laughs> to each their own idea. To, yeah, there, there are so many people that interact with photography that that. Um, Connor, the camera's there. I'm I'm, I'm thinking. Um, <laughs> there's so many different ways to interact with photography that it's it's hard for me to say that one is like the right way to do it or what I would recommend. There's tons of great available cameras, and maybe that's something that I would recommend is the camera that you have, um, as long as it works. As long as um, it works. Yeah, so there's no need to stress about getting high-end gear or you need to get this specific camera to learn how to take pictures or to take good pictures. The reality is most, like most SLRs, like the ones we have here, are gonna take incredible pictures. Uh, most point and shoots will take great pictures if you use them within their limitations. Um, okay, I think that's good enough yeah. advice. Let's go for <laughs> another we actually do have we have a whole a whole video on advice for beginner photographers. We do so maybe with we point can. and shoots. Yeah, with point and shoots, which is pretty cool. It's an easy way to start, and they're quite nice to carry. Yeah. So let's. So leave we it can there. put a link in the description or something. There'll be that. a link here, here, and there. Yeah. Okay. We have T Frankton dot JPEG JPG. Uh, yes, it's back. Yeah, we're happy to be back. Favorite. It's uh, Q and A two point I guess. Yeah. Favorite experience <laughs> using a really cheap camera film or digital and I'm gonna give you give me one of each and like uh, one phrase for you the good experience camera and experience camera and experience so film film and digital no, I don't know if first. I have that many good digital ones <laughs> well then you don't have good experience yeah I don't have good experience um, uh, a, a really fun it's it's not a cheap camera but I got it for really cheap um, was negotiating with a man at a flea market that I don't speak the same language as and getting a Canon F1 for free that was all crusty and covered in corrosion um, but fired and then taking it back to our office here and testing it and realizing that it works perfectly. I was there. The ca camera looked very crunchy. Yeah. It looked like it had been on the bottom of a river. Yeah. And I, I've taken some great photos with it. I really love it. I mean, you clean it and it still kind of smells a little bit like mold, but it works and that's what matters. And nothing with digital? I mean, I, like I've owned digital cameras. I have a, a 12 euro little Canon power shot that I carry around all the time. And you That's, enjoy? Yeah, okay. it's like a little CCD, one of the little CCD yeah. guys. The, the one Digi, you have in your bag, though. Yeah. Okay. The we did a shorts Revolution. on your bag, so we can check that out. Yeah. Okay, I'll go in with experience with really cheap camera film. Um, really cheap camera film. I mean, I have a lot of cameras that cheap. Is, uh, in itself, I guess like the Alpha Clack is a very cheap camera. You've used one of those? Yeah, I have one. I have a how to load video on YouTube on my channel. <laughs> Recommend it. Um, wow. So the Alpha Clack is a very simple one shutter speed. Yeah. But people that go for the Holga and want to shoot that like kind of like lo-fi kind of photography, forget that the Alpha Clack shoots six by nine, but it has a curved back. Hmm. So it kind of is like. The defect of the lens is it's pretty bad, so because the curved field corrects that. Yeah. So it's really nice. It gives you six by nine negatives. It's one shutter speed, so you kind of have to play with that. But I think that camera's it I mean, was very cheap, and it was know? it's better than a Holga in my opinion. Yeah, it probably has a much nicer lens. Yeah. So that would be my experience with film and on digital. I think here at work we have had a lot of point and shoots that go in the trash because they are you know they weren't appealing for a lot of people. Nowadays mm. they are, so we're putting them the extra effort to put them online. But I think I've had a couple of those double A SD card mm -hmm. digital cameras because digital cameras had a lot of proprietary batteries and nowadays it's all proprietary. Yep. But back then they were double A's and SD card and that was the sweet spot. So I'd yep. say like something like that. It's been fun to just carry in your pocket. I also really enjoy the dad video cams. So yeah, like, like yeah, yeah. 16 to 300x mm -hmm. stabilized. Those are really fun. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's my experience with those. Let's go to the next one. Kayox. I think I read that right. Do you? you do you do exchanges? I have an X Pen and wish to exchange for a Leica M digital camera. I guess we call it trades. Well, yeah, Trade -in. we call it trades. But yes, 
Uh, we do do exchanges. You can sell gear to us directly, or you can exchange it for store credit. Uh, it's the same process. You'd basically tell us what you have. We would give you a preliminary offer. Then if you are happy with that, you'd send us the gear. We would test it and make sure everything is okay. Uh, send you a final offer, both in cash or in trade-in value. We do give you a little bit more for a trade-in. Um, and then you'd like, be able to trade your gear. It's like 10 to 20% more we give for trade-ins because it's kind of like an easy way for people to change the other gear. Yeah. And it helps us move inventory, which is always good. Yeah. But yeah, I've done that for myself. Every time I want to buy something that's hefty price point, I grab something from my you know, closet and I sell a couple cameras to the store. It <laughs> removes the edge on the purchase mm -hmm. and it helps a little bit. But yeah, we do. Like you said, we sell straight to cash. We also trade in. Mm -hmm. And also we give you store credit, which you can use in a timely manner. I think there's an expired date to that, but obviously we do do that. So yeah. you can trade in and wait a little bit if the camera you want is not available yet. Mm -hmm. So that's an option. Um, TP pick. How do you know what your camera is underexposing or overexposing a picture? The light meter. Um, <laughs> most cameras, uh, especially past about the 50s, uh, will have a built-in light meter, and that should tell you um, if your photo is over or underexposed based on your current settings. Uh, the, I guess, difficulty of that is that a lot of these cameras are still 50 years old, so the light meters are not necessarily always working correctly. Or the, upper, or the shutter speeds yeah, that they're giving true. you might be like, oh, you should shoot at 1 1,000 and they're not that speed. Yeah. So the camera is telling you to shoot at a certain speed, but then the actual time that your camera, your camera is not working properly and the timing is not what it says it is. So. And one thing I would say, one of the best ways to do is what Connor says, just try to follow the, the light meters, like basically matching needle. Yeah. Uh, and then when you send your film to a lab, try to send it to a lab if you can and get your negatives and check them on a light table or against the window. Mm. And if there's differences in density, so if you see like some shots look like dark or some sh shots look like overexposed, that will let you know that something was wrong. Mm. Obviously, if you take notes, that helps to know what speed or what thing is not working correctly. Yeah. But it's very important to check the negatives because if you're scanning, the scanners will compensate for you. Yeah. They will scan those shadows and make them muddy or they'll get the highlights and try to bring them down and create yeah. some weird. So the scanner will in a way, because the scanner is just basically taking a picture of your film it will try to compensate and the operator will try to fix it. So the negatives are the only ones that will tell you the truth about what your camera is doing. Yeah, but, that's or a, having a cool testing machine like we do, but that's a very different yeah, topic. That's a really good point about the negatives. Um, yeah, I mean, one way to be sure everything works is to buy it at our store, because we do have those machiners and we are testing them all the time, so. Yeah, but if you, yeah. if you are buying something somewhere and you want to shoot, best way is always take notes, try the different speeds, different apertures, develop and check densities, and that will really help you. Um, let's see, we have Luis Montes. What K-mount alternative to Pentax are there? Rico. Tons, there Genon. are tons. Yeah, Rico, Genon, Cosina is a big one. Um, Petri probably has them. Exacta has a K-mount camera. Um, there's K-mount Zenits. Uh, Pentax was really open with all of their lens mounts, with M42 and with uh, K, they made them open mounts so other manufacturers were able to make cameras for them. And that you end up with a ton of different options for lenses and for cameras. Um, yeah, I think I wrote an article once about, about cheap, um, <laughs> getting a good 35 millimeter SLR for under 100 euro. And basically advice number one was Pentax K. Um, because there's so many different options. Like you said, from, from companies like Shinon and Cosina especially are some really great cameras for really, really... And same with lenses. Yeah. So yeah. even more people in lenses probably than in, in bodies. Yeah. yeah. Okay, next one we have Konstantinovic. Uh, best Soviet camera in your opinion? There's a lot of options. Um, I've had a lot of fun with fed rangefinders. I won't say that they're good, cameras, but they're fun and they're small and they get the job done. Um, 
have access to gray lenses. So. I think the I I honestly haven't shot a lot of uh, Soviet cameras, but the one I have enjoyed that I own is the one twenty kind of like Horizon, like the medium format the one swing lens with one. the swing lens. Yeah, it, it's super fun. This is really weird to find and hard to find. Supposedly it's collectible, mm. but that one's really really fun. But I haven't used a lot of uh, Soviet cameras myself. I had a Kia 88 that I really liked. Does it's the Pentagon Six count as Soviet? Sword? Well, the the Kia 60. Okay, well that's not. So I haven't shot that one. Well, it's a, it's similar. Okay. But yeah, yeah. I had a Kia 88, which is the Hasselblad copy. That's uh, the one that if you change the shutter speed before you cock, you break the camera. No. Yeah, I think one of those has the whole thing that you have to change the shutter speed after you cock, if not. Or there's read about it just in case. Yeah, they they can be a little finicky. I mean, my main takeaway from owning it was that I, I wanted a Hasselblad, and then I bought a Hasselblad instead. <laughs> Got the real deal. Okay, we have Ira Filmikuva. Film photo. Film photos in Finnish. Connor knows Finnish, I don't. How common is film photography in Finland? Has film photography increased in recent years? I think it's uh, pretty common here maybe relative to other places. There's not that many people that live in Finland in general, so maybe the percentage of people that like film photography is is higher than other places. Uh, I don't have any data to support that, but we are here, so <laughs> already we, that's 30 people. We probably have helped a lot in yeah. the development of having a film, like film camera store, uh, developing and repair service for some people. Obviously we don't offer repairs to most, but Sometimes clients years ago could do it with us. Hmm. Uh, and I think, has film photography increased in recent years? Like at the second question, yes, it has a lot. Yeah. Especially it's moved generations down. So now it's a younger generation and demographic that's shooting film. Uh, before it was a lot, in the store we noticed that it used to be a lot of collectors that wanted like every single camera. And those people have kind of like slowly diminished the purchasing. Uh, yeah. And now it's a lot of newcomers buying the first camera. We actually sell like ready kits it's yeah. like a body with a lens, and we even included like the service of installing a battery in a roll of film, and people are choosing that, which indicates that the people are happy for you to provide that first roll, but like you know, ready. So I think it is. It's grown a lot, and I think it will continue to grow in the next few years. Obviously, film prices like tamper a little bit with that. Like they they, they yeah, slow it true. down, but film needed to be at a price where it was reasonable for manufacturers to reinvest in know-how mm -hmm. and machines mm -hmm. but yeah let's yeah see. i would say it's still it's still growing interest yeah. okay wait a minute best way to learn camera repair uh to find somebody that lives near you and to become their apprentice or work here or work here which is th that's what we do here we've run uh camera technician school for a number of years now this is i guess our third year is coming up um, where you learn to test and check things and clean and sort of these foundational skills to become a mechanic if you have the aptitude for it. And then the people that do have the aptitude for it Continue. have been yeah have been trained by our master mechanics uh, to learn to repair specific things. Uh, the, the issue, and I know a lot of people are like, well, why can't I learn it online? Why can't I do it at home? Because you don't have a way to verify that you've repaired something. Um, you can take something apart, you can clean all the pieces, you can put it all back together, you can know your camera inside and out, but if you don't have a machine that tells you how long the shutter's open, you can never be sure that the shutter's working properly. Yeah. So that's what we bring, and that's what a, a, a master would bring to an apprentice, is, is that equipment, in a lot of sense. And one of the things I think the common, I won't say misconception, but the common trend lately has been a lot of self-taught people, which is not impossible, but it can be done, is the idea of you can learn all kinds of different models, mm. but it's really hard to master just one camera model. You can be like the Olympus OM person, mm -hmm. and the Nikon F might be completely different inside, and I'm not a mechanic myself, so I'm speaking out of what I see here at work. But we have people that are, you know, specialized on Hasselblads or Rolleiflexes or large format shutters or, you mm -hmm. know, things like this, like a camera's Mamiya. So don't expect that you might start learning by learning all models. Mm -hmm. If you want to learn something, buy a couple beat up cameras and try to break them apart and open them and see and try to get there. And like Connor said, if you can get somebody that can teach you and if you can get some sort of testing equipment to do, 
the due diligence of knowing if the shutters are ready, calibrated. Like I've been calibrating lenses for just learning how to do it. And the difference between F8 and F5.6 on a 50 1.8 is so small that without a machine, it's almost, well, it's impossible to really yeah. know what's going on there. So not so easy, sadly, but they are very, very, very needed. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a lifetime commitment if you really want to get into it. Even just to learn, if you want to learn every Minolta camera, it would be years and years of work. Don't try that. <laughs> um, okay, next question. Ipeli, what is the single most e expensive item you've ever sold? How much? Um, like the store or me personally? <laughs> well, I guess it's the store. We're well, in camera yeah, stores. Channel. We've, we've um, definitely sold many things well over 10,000 euro uh, at a single time. Um, I think we had a, the, the thing that comes to mind as a recent sale was uh, the Leica M6 titanium kit. And that's not super recent, but it was a Leica M6 titanium with the matching titanium lens. And that was like exactly 10,000. Yeah. Um, and it sold pretty quickly too. Like it didn't sit for very long on our yeah. website. We also had, I would say we had a black paint Leica 50 Sumilux. Mm -hmm. If anybody knows about Leicas, they're expensive. If you ever check what they call black paint, which was this black lacquer that they did in the 50s, 60s, yeah. 70s. And uh, the original ones look like they've been thrown on the ground and driven over. Yeah, it didn't hold but, up very well. <laughs> no, but the lenses are very collectible. And the yeah. Sumi looks sold for somewhere around 25,000 euros. Yeah, I think we put it, I remember putting that up on the website. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we have sold that. And I think that might be the most expensive, unique item yep, we've ever sold. Specific thing. Yeah. But yeah. Th that would be it, I would say. Like a people. Like a people. Um, what do we have here? J G B X five photo the best flash to be used on a Yashica C T L R please. Well, best is a hard <laughs> word. First of all, yeah, um, I guess because your Yashica T uh, is a leaf shutter camera, um, it doesn't matter what shutter speed you use, and it shouldn't really matter too much what flash you use. You'll just need one that has a PC sync cable or a PC sync port and then you cable it yourself. Um, I wouldn't worry so much about the flash itself. You can basically um, get a pretty cheap, like a Chinese one if you want a new one or an old vintage one if you want just one speed. Um, I recommend, I have it on <laughs> yeah. the computer, that's why. I yeah. recommend the METS 45 CT3, CT4s. Yeah. Those are like the bracket ones. They have like a little L bracket mount. Yeah. They separate the flash quite a bit. It kind of gives you a good grip. It shoots quite powerful, but also has a lot of manual settings. Yeah, it's adjustable. You need a PC sync, obviously, for the uh, camera. Like, he's, like Connor said, it's the camera syncs at all shutter speed. So you can shoot 500th of a second or one second if you want. But this is a very simple, basic, reliable flash. Yeah. It was used by professionals. Mm -hmm. It is bulky, okay? It's yeah. bigger than your camera, <laughs> and it's pretty heavy. But it is amazing to use. And if you watch a couple of YouTube videos, I think Willem Verbeek and uh, Negative uh, Feedback have used it extensively as a handheld flash because it is very, very good. It lets you pivot and bounce, mm. which is really good. You can bounce up, you can bounce sideways, yeah, that is which nice is style. really nice. You can yeah. fill, like, flashes photography, as we just did a video shooting yeah. the SWC, yeah. can be very harsh. Yeah. So having the option to bounce off a wall or bounce off the roof is quite nice. Or just, just use the flash it. on a different strength. I mean, that's... Yeah. The, yeah so, so you can get a, a cheap vintage flash that's going to be one strength, and it's going to Black. really strong um, or you can get yeah that's a, a slightly more advanced thing and it's nice because you can change the, the the sensitivity of it the strength of it that's um, the recommendation and they're pretty cheap yeah yeah Flashes a lot of are cheap stuff. because nobody knows how to use them nowadays so well, I, I barely know how to use them so. yeah we have next question Sera Dest for 2407 reading the names is going to be actually pretty hard uh, what do you think about the a mount in the Minolta's and Sony Alpha Oh, you chose this one for sure. Yeah, I did. I chose this one. Um, yeah, in our office, there's a fun debate about what the best autofocus camera is uh, between the Canon EOS 300 and the Minolta Dynax 5. 
the Minolta wins. The Minolta is, is a far better kit. We're both Team Minolta, so the technicians... Uh, I use both, but I have... I just recently picked <laughs> well, I up... Well, I actually do have both as well. <laughs> I picked up the Minolta from the outlet like a year and a half ago, maybe yeah. two years ago. And it's pretty amazing because it starts focusing the moment you put it on your eye. Mm. So it kind of goes like you already prevent that you don't even have to half press it it kind of like you put it to your eye and it already goes to whatever's mm -hmm. in the middle of the frame i remember like yeah. i didn't use it this summer but i would say the minolta dynax 5 and i guess the better ones are even better is surprisingly good and mm -hmm. the minolta lenses because they didn't really live on even though sony did adopt them with the a system but then killed it they are very affordable, yeah. as in the Canon, for example, EF, they're used on the Black Magics we're shooting right now. Yeah. And these have retained value a lot more. Yeah. So a Minolta 51.7 is like 100 bucks, but then, you know, a Canon 50, I guess a Canon 50 1.8, there's so many. Yeah, they're, um, they're about the same. Yeah, cost. But, but, the but the point is still there. Is, is really nice. Yeah. I, I think Minolta, yeah. Minolta wins. I, I mean, using them next to each other, I think it can be clear why Canon won, uh, but yeah, like you said, the, the Minolta lenses being so much more available, uh, for a budget shooter, they can be, like, that's the, the entry point for a lot of people. Um, so just go great. for one that's a little bit newer. Um, the M uh, Dynax 7000, or it's not even a Dynax, just the Minolta 7000 AF, that first one. Oh, the that's robot looking slow. one? That is slow. Go for the Dynax 5. The Dynax 60 is one that I have that it's I really the ones, like. The ones that are like fungly. Because <laughs> well, they're kind of like modern. But there's a lot of ugly. them that are really ugly. Yeah. Um, yeah, the XI line as well is a, a newer line. But they're, they're great cameras. We approve to answer the question. <laughs> Gunner Who 1969. What would you absolutely dream? What would your absolute dream camera to own? I know exactly which one's mine. Oh, you do? And you don't own it already? No, it's out of my budget. Oh. <laughs> I can start by saying, uh, yeah, yeah. I would love to own my favorite 35 mil camera for my own photography has been Leica M2. And like I said, in the a black paint, a black paint M2, but the button rewind, I kind of find it the most satisfying. Like it's a pretty camera to shoot, and I mean, to see and also to shoot. So that would be my camera to own. The button rewind is the one that's not like this. Like yeah, it's not it has like a, a lever. button on the front, and you press it, and there's like a little circle around. Uh, that would be my absolute dream camera to own. Current prices is between twenty to thirty thousand, so <laughs> it's a little bit out of budget to buy a camera worth a car, mm -hmm. uh, especially when you're trying to buy a house like I am. What would be your dream camera? Yeah, that's a tough question because I. Um, I manage our product team here, so I see, like, everything that comes through. Um, and that, like, one, gets me really excited about some stuff, and two, gets me really disillusioned about a lot of stuff, too. Um, before I worked here, my dream camera, or the, the one camera that I was, like, my Halo camera or whatever, was a, a Contax G, Contax G1 or G2. Oh, wow. I, right? It's kind of crazy to think about it now, because I've held so many of them, and my opinion on them have, has kind of shifted away from wanting to use it. Um, They're special to use, I'll say that. <laughs> I, um, I really love my Hasselblad. I think that um, I came back to Hasselblad after probably five years, six years of not using one. Um, and I'm like, how did I ever use anything else? Um, so Is I'm really any, happy with that. If you had unlimited budget right now, what would you get from the store? What would I get from the store? A bunch of lenses no, for body, the Hasselblad. No, body. <laughs> Uh, he said camera, not lenses. Yeah, well, lenses are part of it. Jeez. Um, Any I don't know. camera. I don't know. The moon one that's yellow? The, yeah, that would be the moon one. You know the Hasselblad yellow one? Well, I would, I would love a... You know what? A Hasselblad X1D or the X-series digital medium format. Oh, wow. That's the digital one that you want. Yeah. Okay. I think those are so cool and so pretty. They are kind of cool. Yeah. It looks like they're missing the back, but yeah. Or, or no, the digital back that I could put on my current Hasselblad. Okay. That 907. Uh, we can count that as a whatever camera. it is. 907 X. Then, yeah, the 907, and it has the wide-angle lens, and then it comes with the digital back, and you can put the digital back onto the film Hasselblad. And you don't even have to put a cable or yeah, anything. It's it just so cool. knows that it you're taking a picture. It's pretty cool. Yeah. It, we had one in the store. We Did had one. I don't know if it's sold. I, let's not <laughs> check just in case. But, yeah. Um. 
That would be your dream camera. Yeah, that would be Tobias really cool. Tobias Prince dot analog. Would you recommend bulk rolling black and white shooting to rolls a month? I picked this one for you. Okay. Um, <laughs> I've done a lot of bulk loading in black and white. HP5 was my jam. Bulk loading is great if the price of the film you're buying is cheaper uh, in the bulk loading stage than in buying it finished. Obviously, converted rolls by the factory is way better. Bulk loading can add a lot of scratches if you reuse the canisters too much. There can be light leaks if the little felt on the side is coming off. Mm. But I did a lot of it, but it was when the bulk roll was 50 bucks, which was really cheap. You get around 18 to 20 rolls. Mm. I would say yes, it's worth it if it's cheaper. And if you want to do custom rolls, like 12 exposures, like if you have yeah, a hard time finishing rolls, a roll yeah. and you develop at home, which means your price of developing is like 50 cents, mm -hmm. I'd say yes. Uh, but if you're buying, like for example, Kodak has lost their mind with the price of bulk film. Uh, they've just gone more expensive than if you bought all the film yourself finished by them, because mm -hmm. they just probably don't want to do it. So it's a way to cut the market. But yeah, I'd say do it if you kind of want to do the experimental part and if you can save money. If you're not saving money, don't do it. Just buy rolls. Yeah, that was my... I included this one because I, I know you know more about bulk rolling than I do. But I'd also, he included two rolls a month, and that, to me, felt like it's a pretty low months. number. It's ten months of shooting with one bulk. Yeah. Maybe he likes to spend all the money at once and then do it slowly. Yeah. I don't recommend it. You need a bulk loader. You need the time. It's like an hour. Well, not an hour, but almost an hour to like do the 20 rolls and then cut the well, leaders. And... I shoot more than two rolls a month, and I, I've never even considered bulk rolling. Yeah, but we have like like well, different conditions here at the I, store. Yeah, I guess. I guess. It, it's nice to work at a store. We have <laughs> discounts on film, so work at camera store. Yeah. Um, then we have cost off. Photo, I can't uh, say a, that. That's a lot of numbers. We'll put it on the screen. Yeah, it'll be on the screen. <laughs> is the price of Leica cameras going down in the future? Did you put this one for me too? Well, uh, yeah, sure. You can go ahead. Well, you're the pricing team. I, I do. I mean, I think we both have opinions about this. I think they're not going to go down, yeah. per se. Uh, Leica cameras are, uh, is it finite is the word? Like there's a limited number of them? Yeah. So Leica's still making the MPMA and M6. Mm -hmm. uh, M6 was introduced a year ago. Um, but the M2s, the M3s, the M4s, M4Ps, all these other older cameras, there's so many. Leica has carried their value. Uh, the cameras have carried their value a long time. There's collectors, there's users. Um, and it's hard for the price to go down. The only way it could go down is if like, like something huge happen to the film market so mm. either film disappears or color film disappears yeah or suddenly i don't know something random happens but i don't think the price of that is going to go down it's been more the other way around i think like like us have sustained their price quite a lot and there was articles like a decade ago i remember my honeymoon reading of like buying a leica is free to test in the sense that you put like a thousand bucks to buy a leica not that you can find them for that price anymore but you put 2000 you buy it, you use it for six months to a year, you sell it, and you basically spend maybe 100 plus minus. Yeah. So it's kind of like a free rental. Yeah. And then you get the gist if you want to shoot a Leica. Yeah. But I don't think they're going to go down. And repairing them are pretty complicated, and they're having some very peculiar issues, like the light fla flap on the top is having issues, and the mechanics have hard times finding the parts. So there'll be even less that are working conditions. So I think they're they're yeah. not going down, and the hype on Leica is real. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's a very um, conscious thing that Leica does with their production of the new cameras, at least, where they don't want the prices to go down. They're not they're intentionally making a set amount to make them more valuable. Um, if they really wanted to, they probably could put another production line on and have twice as many cameras, and then have them sit on store shelves. But they don't want that. They I want them to be sold out at all. I've times. always had that theory, but I don't know if that is true per se. Like, film Leicas are expensive. They sell around five thousand ish euros or dollars, mm. but their digital stuff is nine to ten thousand. Yeah. So, they are not making as much money. My conclusion is more like they rather sell the digital because they have more profit and people flip digital more often. Mm. You buy an M6. I mean, we're still shooting the M6 Classic. I still shoot an M2 that was made 65 years ago. 
Yeah. So that is a bit more of shooting themselves in the foot. I think the digital is a, a bit more interesting. But yeah, I think the prices are not going to go down. They're going to settle. Like they have settled quite a bit. Uh, obviously, there's hypes and you know the YouTube game of M6, and then it goes down. Like it's a little bit of a wave, but it's not going to like drastically drop. Yeah, I can't. I can't imagine them going down in price anytime soon, unless something outlandish happens. Yeah, but yeah, that's been the Q and A. Like we said, uh, leave your questions below or on Instagram. We're going to be publishing the, the you know the questionnaire on Thursday afternoons yeah. or mid morning, depending on where you are in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, our Thursday here in Finland. Yeah. But yeah, and uh, thanks for watching. Yeah. Yeah. I've been Nico. Thanks for, I've been Connor uh, from Camera Store here. Camera store from Camera Store, yeah. With um, a K. So we will see you next week with a, another couple answers and questions. Yep. Thanks for watching. Bye.